Good morning, and welcome to Christ Fellowship Eastside. I'm Phil, one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship, where we seek to multiply disciples to the glory of God. And, you know, as, as I was thinking about as we come to worship Jesus this morning, uh, you know, there, there are times where um, I, I think even just in broader culture, as, as you look at what is the church, and there's a sense of like, there's this kind of institution, and there's kind of this anti-institutional bent where, can you really trust the church? Can you really trust leaders and people and all of that? And, and with so much chaos in the world and disruption of those things, you kind of, you, you come into scenarios and, and you have question marks over your head on whether or not this is reliable, and you wonder uh, some of you may be coming in, you feel discouraged because uh, for you, church may be nothing more than just an empty ritual that you feel you just have to do and churn through week by week. Some of you may feel uh, disheartened by issues or problems you see in, in a local church or in the church more broadly speaking or in denominations and those kinds of things and feel discouraged uh, and dis disheartened by that. Uh, and some of you may feel defeated because you look at the church in all of its smallness and insignificance and the, the little amount that we contribute to the big national narrative and on social media and, and look at all these other voices and the world's voices around us and feel disheartened by the church's lack of influence and strength and power in the world around you. And so you may walk into a service like this and say, well, I just want to worship Jesus, but man, the church, that just feels awkward. Um, I want to encourage you before we worship with these words from Matthew chapter 16. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But you, he asked them, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus responded, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he gave the disciples orders to tell no one that he was the Messiah. And then there's the part that no one likes to read after this. Uh, from then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, and be killed and raised on the third day. But Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, no, Lord, this will never happen to you. And Jesus turned and told Peter, the second thing he tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. And so all in one chapter, you see this idea of the church. Jesus puts out this idea of the church for like the first time to his disciples. And he says, it's going to be victorious. It's going to beat Satan and hell and death and all of that through this, this weird new thing that I'm doing. I'm going to do that through the church, through what we're, who we are as a people this morning. That's how God is going to have a victory. He's going to beat the gates of hell. It's going to be victorious in power. It's guaranteed by Jesus. But notice, it's in spite of who we are. It's in spite of the fact, he, he, you know, on the one hand, he's commending Peter, and on the next hand, he's saying, get behind me, Satan. Like, we, we are a church of broken, flawed people. We are a church full of Peters. We're a church full of what we've been hearing about through this sermon series. We're a church full of Jonahs that, 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 that so many times just disregard our mission and our calling by Jesus. But guess what? Jesus is victorious through that. Jesus has promised to defeat the gates of hell through this, through this broken group of flawed people that are gathered here together to worship. And you may feel it more significantly this week than others. Or you may not feel it today, but maybe it'll be next week or next month that you feel it. But Jesus will have the victory, and we can trust in that as we worship him together this morning. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that the battle belongs to you, that you have conquered sin and hell and death and Satan, and you have chosen to use us the weak things of this earth, this church that you have made your bride to be the source, the, 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 
the subject of that victory, the, the ones that get to announce that victory to the watching world. And I pray as we gather here and bring all of our weakness and frustration, disheartenment, uh, discouragement even into this space, and, and that, that you would help us to be encouraged, not in our own personal victories, but in the victory that you give us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, All I see is the battle. When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. When all I see is a mountain, you see a mountain. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me there's nothing to fear for i am safe so when i fight so when i fight i'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high oh god battle belongs to you every fear i lay at your feet i'll sing through the night oh god the battle belongs to you amen church and if you are for me who can be against me For Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. When all I see are the ashes, you see my beauty. Yes, you do, Lord. When all I see is a cross, you see the attitude. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine through the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. Sing almighty. An almighty fortress. You go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine. Shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of. Come on, church. Keep shining the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing. Stand against the power of our God. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Every fear I may have. 
We have a God who's done great things, church. Do you believe you can do those things again? Let us worship our King. Let us bow at His feet. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what He's done. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has to create things. He has to create things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You freed, free captain, and break every chain. Oh, God, you have to Faithful forevermore. You've been faithful for every song. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have to create. You'll do them again. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. to read a very familiar scripture together out loud if you would. John 3 16, would you read it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You know when you read a verse like this, especially in a, in, in a church setting, we can't help but stop and really think about and embrace the love that God has for us. God loves us. 
And this love was demonstrated through the sending of his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross so that we could have our sins forgiven, so that we could have relationship with him for all of eternity. This is the love of God that he has for us. And it's unconditional, right? Like it's not dependent on things we do or what we feel. Regardless of our physical condition, God loves us. Regardless of our, uh, our emotional condition, God loves us. Regardless of our mental condition, God loves us. It is this unconditional conditional love. And so this morning, wherever you find yourself, if you find yourself uh, on a mountaintop and in, in, in the high of life, embrace the fact that God loves you. If you find yourself discouraged or beaten down or just, just tired from life, understand this, God loves you. And before we get into our next song, I just want to give a, a, a few moments of, of quietness. There'll be some music playing where you can do two things. I'd ask you to, to engage God in prayer and do two things. One is thank him for his love. Thank him uh, for the sending of his son, Jesus Christ. Thank him for the forgiveness of sins. Thank him for his undying, continuing love for you. And then I'd ask you to do this as well. I ask him if, if, if he would show you and demonstrate his love to you in a very real and tangible way today, this week, so that you can see and experience and really feel the love of God in a way that maybe you haven't before. And in the quietness of these moments, I'd ask you to do those two things. Go in prayer. Thank him for his love and ask him to, to show you so that you can experience and feel his love. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing the Father turns His face away As wounds which mar the chosen
pray with me, church. God, we love you so much. We thank you for your goodness, for your love, for your grace in our lives. Lord, draw us close to you this morning. Let us see more of you this morning so that we leave this place changed. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, church. You may be seated. Pastor Chastine, if you come. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Brent. Well, good morning, church. I feel like I'm off center. Am I off center? Just a little bit. Maybe it's the room. Maybe the room's off center. So, um, good morning. I'm Pastor Chastine, one of the pastors here at Christ Fellowship Eastside. And uh, we're going to wrap up Jonah this morning. And so, um, it's going to be a good time. I'm going to ask you as we are going to pick up in a moment, go ahead and flip over or at least hold your place in 2 Kings 14. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit on that in a moment. Now, if you're on your phone, that may prove difficult. You can't exactly put your finger in it. But I want to kind of encourage you. I'm going to kind of start there in a way and then kind of wrap it around. But uh, this morning as we close uh, Jonah, I want, to, I want to present a few things. So I want to establish and expound upon a truth that is revealed in three different ways. And then I've got two points. And then I've got two applications. And so uh, I just want to kind of give you an idea. So if you're taking notes... Um, I think that'll be helpful as we walk through this. So again, I'm going to start with these three revelations of a singular truth that I think we are going to see woven throughout Jonah, and actually pre-Jonah in a way. So if you will, we'll be ready there. But the book of Jonah reveals an amazing truth, and it's actually probably pretty difficult for most of us to hang on to, probably to understand and to rest in in it. And I think we're going to see that it was very difficult for Jonah, which is why I say he probably relates to more of us than we think. I know he relates to me in many ways, and the way I am, um, I'm going to use the, the word indifferent, if you will, oftentimes. Okay, so, so hang with me. Um, it's going to be this amazing truth. You ready for it? Here we go. God passionately desires to bring salvation to the nations. Not a shocker here, right? That's not a shocker, but, and he does so by blessing the wicked and pursuing the indifferent. Now, that one... That part of it may make you think, wait, what? That's exactly what God is doing. It's what we're going to see. It's it's a simple thought, probably a little off, maybe feeling weird, but I'm going to dig into it a little bit this morning. So if you've been walking with us through this study, okay, you should have a pretty good handle of where we are in the book of Jonah. We're we're going to be in the final seven, eight eight verses. But I want to give you an idea of how we got here on the off chance this is your first time with us, or perhaps you found us online. All right, so this morning, we're introduced to Jonah from the start, right? So if you flip over, if you were to look at Jonah chapter 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amity. Get up, go to the great city of Nineveh, and preach against it, because their evil has come up before me. So get up and go. And so he starts this book, and it's kind of like, well, well who's Jonah, right? I mean, why, and why is it coming to Jonah? What's going on here? Well, The first week, I had a guest preacher, Mike Thompson, came, and he kind of set things up a bit. But I want to go a little deeper. So if you'll flip over with me to 2 Kings chapter 14, which I asked you to hang on to, and we're going to come back to it. 2 Kings 14, verse 23 says, In the 15th year of Judah's, King Amaziah, son of Joash, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, became king of Israel and Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did what was evil 
in the, in the Lord's sight. He did not turn away from all the sins Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had caused Israel to commit. Verse 25, he restored Israel's border from Labo Hamath as far as the Sea of the Arabah, according to the word the Lord, the God of Israel, had spoken through his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amity, from gath Hefer. For the Lord saw that the affliction of Israel was very bitter for both slaves and free people. There was no one to help Israel. The Lord had not said he would blot out the name of Israel under heaven, so he delivered them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. So notice something with me as we start looking at this. First instance here. Jonah was a prophet of the Lord, living in the northern kingdom of Israel. And Jeroboam II was king, and he reigned for 41 years. And as we just read, he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Jeroboam II was not a godly leader leading the people through a great period of holiness before the Lord. It's the exact opposite of that. But what do we see? Yet God, through Jonah, his prophet, does what? He proclaims the restoration of Israel's borders. He's going to expand and retake the borders. And that's where we're going to find our first revelation of the truth that I revealed to you a moment ago. Right? And this is the first instance, and it doesn't really make sense, right? But Israel, think about this. There's three examples of this we're going to see. Israel, if I can get it turned, where's my notes? <clears throat> is wicked and indifferent, and what happens? God continually pursues them, and he blesses them. This is really important to the story of Jonah. Really important. See, prior to his call to go to Nineveh, he's already on on the Lord's path to reveal what's going to happen. He reveals blessing. He demonstrates this truth. And so Jonah's already kind of seeing that, man, God sure is gracious to Israel. But, but, but they're Israel, right? I mean, we're God's people. He's supposed to be. God's going to be good. He said he was going to be good to us, right? So here they are, blatant rebellion, opposite direction. And yet, here he is, God's speaking blessing through Jonah. He's going to restore their borders. So you might be thinking, well, wait a minute. If they're being sinful, why isn't he coming down on them? Again, he said he wasn't going to blot out their name. He was going to, there was no one help to deliver them. Clearly, the leadership wasn't there. Clearly, he wasn't going to lead them through a path of re revival and refreshing in the Lord. And so we find ourselves, here's Jonah. He is seeing that God is being gracious. So this nation that is openly turning from God, while they are acting with indifference toward him, God pursues them and extends blessing to them. That's amazing. Hang on to that for a minute. Think about it for a minute. He's doing this. This is who God is. Does he still discipline Israel? I think you can go back and read the Old Testament and see clearly he does. Time and time again. But in this instance, he is still pursuing after them, chasing after them, such that he wants to extend his blessing. And it's filled with instances of how he's doing this. And here's the thing. Jonah knows this, which is why it's really striking in a moment that we're going to see these revelations of this truth. So, bear with me. The, we'll go back to Jonah chapter 1. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah, tells him to get up and go to the Nineveh and preach against it because their evil has come up before God. Now, make no mistake, this is a huge undertaking. This is a tall task for Jonah. Here's why. Think about it. We've already talked about this, but leading up, Assyria is where Nineveh is, right? So Nineveh's in Assyria, and they're not good people. <laughs> they're, they're gruesome. They're evil, wicked people. And yet, God's calling him to go and preach it. It's, it's kind of like, I, you can go back. I'll show my age with this. Go back 20 years, and I'll give you a couple of examples. But this is, so for anyone that's probably over 20, maybe over 15, this is ISIS, Right? Or, or now, this is Russia, just straight up rolling in. Like, just, and, and let's just imagine, let me put, put yourself in, in Jonah's sandals for a moment. All right? See what I did there? Because I didn't have shoes. See what I did there? Put yourself in Jonah's sandals and think for a moment. This is, what, this is like God telling you to go to Russia or to an ISIS and proclaim his judgment because of the atrocities of what's going on. 
of ongoing war, terrorism, those things. And that's exactly what happened to Jonah. He's asking them to go to your enemy and proclaim this truth. And also, let's keep in mind, Amos, the prophet Amos, his, a contemporary of Jonah, is on, he's in parallel preaching against Israel for their sins and their wickedness at the same time. Same time, this is going on. He's crying out against the sins of Israel, prophesying that at some point God's going to raise up a nation, namely Assyria, to come and overcome Israel. So put that in the bank of this is Jonah being called to go to that very country to proclaim God's judgment. That's difficult. I mean, we think we have it hard, right, going across the street, (laughs) talking to your neighbor. This is a big deal. He's setting up to go talk to the people that are going to overcome and conquer them. And that's what God has called him to do. So as we see, we're going to see as, as Jonah, this word comes to Jonah, we see the second revelation of the amazing truth we talked about a moment ago, but now it's Nineveh's turn. They're a wicked, evil nation. But God is gracious, and he is pursuing them. How do we know he's pursuing them? He's sending a prophet to them to proclaim a message. And we're going to nitpick that message in a moment. So he comes, the word of the Lord in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, it comes to Jonah again, get up, go to Nineveh, proclaim the message that I have for you. And this time he goes. It took, him, it took some convincing inside of great fish, but he goes. So he goes, he proclaims, and he goes to the city of Nineveh, and he calls out, in 40 days, Nineveh will be demolished. Seven English words, and just so you're counting, five Hebrew words. And I know that from research because I'm not a Hebrew guy. I can't even read. I I couldn't read Hebrew. I'd have to ask Bill how to do it or somebody else, maybe Joel. I don't know. No? Okay. So, five Hebrew words, and that's it. That's the message. That's all he says. But notice with me, I did some look on this, a word study, shall be demolished. You'll appreciate this because where some people would say God relented and he did, but he changed his mind, if you will. Well, here's the thing about will be demolished in the Hebrew is it's a what they call a double entendre. And I may have butchered that. But it can have, in other words, it's a word or a phrase that can have two meanings. And so this is what it can mean. Shall be demolished can mean demolished, right? It can be that, destroyed. But it can also mean transformed. Now, I think we've seen what happened. And we're going to dig into it a little bit further. But Jonah's one-sentence sermon conveys at least a possibility of grace and mercy. Again, God is sending Jonah. He's pursuing the Ninevites through Jonah. And he's extending this message where there's at least an idea, an inkling of some grace. It could be a transformation. Or it could be destruction. And then he gives them 40 days. That's patient. 40 matters is pretty significant in, throughout the Scripture. But he's at least giving them a hint here that it's not instantaneous punishment. There's some grace in here. And we, we know what happens next. The people of Nineveh, those evil, gruesome people, right? Terrible, wicked people. They do just what God's message through Jonah indicated they would. They're transformed. How do we know? Scripture tells us. They heard the word of God proclaimed. How does faith come? By hearing. It's the only way. You got to, it has to be spoken so that you can hear and receive it. It's spoken, they hear it, and they believed. Then they demonstrated humility. They self-denial. They called for a fast, they put on sackcloth, they sat in ashes, an evidence of repentance. In recognition, they also ne- recognize they're needy from the greatest of them to the least, from the king down to the lowest of those Ninevites. This is what they do. They recognize their neediness. They repent of their evil in hopes that maybe God will relent. And God, again, despite 
their wickedness and the indifference that we see in that of the Ninevites. He pursues, he st- extends grace, mercy, and, and blessing toward Nineveh. And he didn't destroy the city. I don't know about you, but that's, that's remarkable. And I can self-identify in many ways. It's remarkable. It's miraculous that he relented, but he transformed them. Which brings us to the final revelation that we see of this truth of how God passionately pursues and desiring all to come to a knowledge of him, even those that are wicked and evil. So Jonah, in many ways, wicked and evil. But God continually pursues him, doesn't he? Did he come to him one time and let it go? No, he doesn't. The word of the Lord comes to Jonah, he flees, which is pretty funny because you can't be where God, you can't be anywhere that God doesn't know where you're at. God pursues him, brings a storm. They find out it's Jonah's deal. He's cast overboard and everything stops, right? So much so that the sailors start crying out to Yahweh rather than Jonah doing so. But God, demonstrating his mercy and grace, doesn't kill Jonah. Could have. Could have let him drown. Sends a great fish to to rescue him. He's continually pursuing him. And during this time, three days and three nights, Jonah repents. And he thanks God for his salvation. And in summary, really, up to this point, despite Jonah's disobedience and really his indifference, like he didn't want to do this because he didn't care about him. He didn't care about the Ninevites. God extended grace and mercy to him, finally such that he, in his distress and his repentance, he realizes, hey, salvation belongs to the Lord. Because it does. Yet we'll see, after God relents of his judgment and demolition of Nineveh, what was Jonah's response? Was he thankful? Was he praising the Lord for such an amazing thing? No. He's mad. Not just mad, but like furious is what the word tells us. He is furious with God. And interestingly, verse 2 of chapter 4, he, he prays to the Lord. Right? So mad he's praying to the Lord, fussing, frustrated. And he reveals the real reason for his sin of disobedience. He, see, he knew, Exodus, he knew Exodus 34. That God is gracious and kind, slow to anger. Is let, you know, he knows that. He knows it, and he knew that God was going to be gracious to Nineveh if he went and was obedient. And that just drove him bonkers. Like he couldn't come to grips with a God that, that was going to be gracious to such an evil, wicked people. This is who Jonah is revealing himself to be. And yet here we find Jonah upset. And notice, like, he's just mad. He, he thought God was going to destroy him. So what does he do? Well, he does like a lot of us, probably. Maybe like me, I should say. He has this pity party, right? He goes outside the city to pout. Now, no one in here is pouting, right? I can imagine we're all good people, good church people. No one in here pouts at God and gets mad. But this is what happens. He's hoping God's going to see it his way and change his mind to destroy the city, right? Here's how I know. God comes to... Jonah says, the Lord asked in verse 4, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah left the city, found a place east of it. He made himself a shelter there and sat in its shade to see what would happen to the city. You notice what happens here? You didn't get a response from Jonah. Like He ignored God. God asked him a question, and he'd be like, I'm so angry at you, I'm not even going to answer. I'm not even going to acknowledge you you asking me a question. And Anyone ever found themselves there? Ever found yourself there? So like, hey, not only does he not acknowledge, he ignores it, doesn't respond, and he goes outside to see what would become. He's still hopeful (laughs) that this city is going to be destroyed. Some way, somehow, God's already relented, but he's hoping. God has spared the city, and he still wants them to be destroyed. He's completely, check it out, not just ignored God, but he's completely ignored God's salvation for Nineveh, which was actually very similar to how he showed mercy and grace to Israel. 
We just read about that in 2 Kings. Was Israel acting holy before the Lord? Were they extending his name to the nations as he called them to, as his chosen people? No, they were not. And yet he pursues them. And he, again, Amos is prophesying that destruction's coming, but Jonah goes and says, but God's going to ex expand our border even in the midst of this blatant rebellion. And God does it. He still does it. He does it. Now, it's pretty crazy, but it should stand out though, right? Jonah's seen this happen, but yet he's still upset to the point that he's asking God to take his life when God's grace is extended to the enemy. It's kind of like the story of the prodigal sons. Now, I know most of you have heard the prodigal son, but there were two of them, right? There were two sons. Most of us are familiar with the story, but the, the younger son comes, asks for his inheritance, leaves wasted away on foolishness and sin, but in his brokenness realizes his need for forgiveness and grace. Comes home. And we know the story how the father is very gracious, sees the brokenness and the contriteness of his younger son, and he's throwing a party, celebrating that he's returned. Then the older son, the one who had stayed behind, who was faithful and obedient, serving while his younger brother was wasting things away, he's furious with his dad. Furious. He doesn't even want to come inside. Stays outside. Stays outside. Because he's upset. You see, he refuses to join the celebration because he didn't believe his younger son what? The younger brother deserved what? Grace and mercy. He doesn't deserve it. He's unfaithful. He's sinful. He's broken. He, I can't believe, God, I can't believe Dad, that you did that. You, you've never... I've been here all this time with my friends. You never slaughtered the fattened calf for my, me and my friends to hang out. Right? He's not deserving of grace and mercy. And see, this is the problem. Therein lies the issue. For all of, for Jonah, for, for ourselves, instead of rejoicing at his brother's salvific restoration and redemption, he's furious that grace is instead extended instead of judgment. So here's the thing, and this, may, this um, you know, chapter 2, verse 9, where Jonah says salvation belongs to the Lord, how easily we, we forget, because it is God's salvation. He extends it to whomever he pleases, not for me to decide, not for you to decide, and that's the crux of the issue. Who, deter who determines who receives God's grace and mercy? God does. And it belongs to him. Remember his, his prayer was he, salvation belongs to the Lord, but yet he's like the older brother in the prodigal sons. He doesn't think that grace should have been extended. Now, granted, put yourself again in his sandals. He knows what kind of country and nation that this is and what they have been known for. Their reputation precedes them. They are not gracious and kind. They are not merciful people. They are hated because of who they are. And yet here we go. God's being gracious, and he delivers them. He transforms them, which leads me. I told you I had three revela revelations of that truth. There they are on the screen. But there's two points I have. The first one is this. God is gracious, and he desires that none should perish. Now, we say that. I think we believe that. But, man, we, I don't know that we know the extent and the breadth, height, depth of that. And it's, that is massive. He desires that none would perish. And I would say praise God to that. I mean, who among us, who among us truly deserves grace and mercy? Anybody in this room? No. We don't deserve any of it. As Romans 5 points out, we were all sinners, enemies of the Lord, right? Yet Christ did what? He died for us. We didn't do anything to earn that. We certainly didn't deserve it. But God in his great mercy and love did it. He did it. He died for us. Why? Because God has a compassionate heart. His heart moves for his enemies. 
of which you, me, we all were prior to salvation in him. We all once were. And I want to tell you, I'm thankful that God in his great love and mercy was compassionate in extending that to me. Because otherwise, we'd all be headed for destruction. Ephesians 2, 4, and 5 says, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And that's the message of Christ. That's the truth. The grace and mercy is available to all of us, even though none of us deserve it. And that's the kind of love that should propel us to make his name known, to extend grace, to extend compassion, to extend mercy to those that we think are our enemy. In other words, it may very well be that the most Christ-like thing that any of us can do today is to forgive someone who we think doesn't deserve mercy and compassion. I remember doing a, um, so Kim and I used to do a lot of stuff with the youth. We helped with the youth a lot growing up, and we had these uh, Disciple Now weekends or Impact weekends or what we, whatever we called them, D weekend, D Now, whatever. And I remember we had a, a, a group of girls, I think we were at her mom's house at the time, and they were walking through. And I, I sat in on some of the Bible study, and there was this, this one lady or girl that was so angry and frustrating at this other girl that her family had brought in to help. And she was, you can call it jealousy, call it whatever, but she made that comment. And I remember I, I, I told her, I said, well, you know, sometimes um, you got to give people what they don't deserve. That's the truth of it. Sometimes you just got to give folks the forgiveness, the love, grace, and mercy that they don't deserve because you didn't deserve it. And so I, I made that statement, and it was almost like a, it was a, a, a deer in the headlight moment for her. Like, oh, what? Yeah. Like, you, you sometimes just got to extend the grace that whether they deserve it or not. And let God work and use that. Let God do his work. Let him do what he only God can do. I can't save people. God does that. Salvation is God's deal, not something that I can do. So, watch what happens next. God, in his, again, he is pursuing Jonah here. He hadn't given up on him. Matter of fact, we know that because he came to him a second time after he repented and he sent him out. Check it out. In verse 6, it says, Then the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew over Jonah to provide shade for his head to rescue him from his trouble. Jonah was greatly pleased with this plant. When dawn came the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, and it withered. Verse 8, as the sun was rising, God appointed a scorching east wind. The sun beat down on Jonah's head so much that he almost fainted, and he wanted to die. He said, it's better for me to die than to live. So notice again, where did the plant come from? God. Who destroyed the plant? God. He appoints this plant to save Jonah from his discomfort, only this time he's switching the lesson. He's reversing things. He's not taking Jonah from distress to deliverance. He's taking him from deliverance to distress to show him what's going on here, to show him a lesson. And again, Jonah's angry at God, and he says this pity party again, right? This is what he does in verse 9. Then God asks Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Yes, it's right, he replied. This time he acknowledges God, and he, he's going to let God hold it a minute, right? Yes, it's right for me to be angry. I'm angry enough to die. Clearly, clearly Jonah has not learned his lesson at this point, right? He has clearly not figured it out that here's, here's the thing. God's grace and mercy is available to all, even his enemies, and he is appointing. He is in control of salvation, and this is who God is. Which leads me to my second point. Despite our indifference, and maybe even our lack of compassion that I think I know I exhibit oftentimes, God loves and pursues the spiritually blind. He runs after those who, who don't know who he is. This is exactly what he's doing. Even, but he also runs after those that do know who he is. He ain't done with Jonah. He could have easily 
finish Jonah off. He, could, he created by the word of his power. He could easily take care of Jonah. But he doesn't. Look with me in verse 10. The Lord said, you cared about the plant, which you did not labor over, and you did not grow. It appeared in a night and perished in a night. Verse 11. So may, not, say may, excuse me, so may I not care about the great city of Nineveh, which has more than 120,000 people who cannot distinguish between their right hand and their left, as well as many animals. This one's free. We know that God talks about, hey, you shouldn't depart from my word from the right or to the left. These people don't even know their right from their left. And this is who he's going to. They have no idea. There's 120,000 people that don't know their right from their left. They don't know any better. They don't know any better. And yet we get angry when God extends grace. They don't know any better. It's kind of like, no, no, don't, don't judge me on this. But back in the day, there's a movie that came out called Forrest Gump. And there's a scene, Lieutenant Dan and Forrest are talking. And you see a couple of these instances of Lieutenant Dan, but in this one in particular, and I was thinking about Jonah 10, verses 10 and 11. Lieutenant Dan asks Gump a question. Have you found Jesus yet, Gump? Most of you probably remember the response. Forrest Gump replies, I didn't know I was supposed to be looking for him, sir. Well, here's the point. Neither do the spiritually blind. They don't know they're supposed to be looking for him. And we have the hope in the, of the world to give them, <laughs> to extend to them. Likewise, the people of Nineveh, spiritually blind, we should expect them to live the way they're living. It's amazing to me. We go around we're like, I can't believe so-and-so did that, or those people act that way, or that group of people. They're lost. They don't know Jesus. They're spiritually blind. Why would we not expect them to act that way? Right? Why wouldn't we? But that's what we do. I cannot believe those Ninevites are doing those destructive things. They don't, they're blinded to God. Of course they are going to act that way. And that very thought should propel us all the more to extend God's grace and mercy to more, to more folks. Because they don't know. They don't know. So two, three revelations of truth, two points, and here's two applications. First application is this. God's heart beats for every nation, tribe, and tongue does ours. You know, we establish this church on the east side. We want to make much of Jesus. We want to multiply disciples to the glory of God. We want to do those things just like that point says because God's heart beats for every tongue, nation, and tribe. You see, this is the way the book of Jonah ends. And people will say, well, why did that happen? Why is it ending with a question? I do think it enables us to see God's heart and to measure ours against it. But I do think, you know, I, I think Jonah wrote the book. And I think that's why I, I'm going to make the statement. I do think he gets it in the end because we have the book, Right? I think if he had left from here and this has ended, bam, done, we may not have it because it was just him and Jonah, right? So I, I think this is here for us to see God's heart for the nations and for us to see how, how should we respond to that. It's easy to get angry and to get frustrated with lost people doing dumb things. Heck, even us people, of Christians do dumb things. We extend grace and mercy because that's what God's called us to do. Like he did with Jonah, God will, will reveal the truth of our hearts. And I'll ask, are we resentful toward our enemies, toward those that are spiritually blind? Are we unconcerned for God's grace being extended to them? That's a heart check for each of us, I hope. My second point of application is this. God has called us and is sending us Will we go show and tell? Will we make much of him? We say every week that I know of, I, I'm sure there's a sprinkling of a week or two where we don't, where we say the gospel goes with you when you leave this place. Because it's, it does. Whether you go to school, and I know school's ending soon. Yay. Actually, I'm not a fan because it blows my routine up. 
but it goes, right? Going to school, athletics, work, extracurricular, all those things, the gospel goes with you. And the reality is that salvific grace has been extended to us. Are we moved with compassion such that it propels us to tell others? I can't answer that question for you. I can only answer that for me. But I want to challenge you this morning as we close our time. Look, God's, God's concern for the nations hasn't changed. It hasn't. He's still calling people to salvation. He's calling them to himself. And he's using us to be a part of that. Talk about miraculous. Using us to do that. That's something you can give your life to. There are a lot of things that I would encourage you not to do and not to pursue and not to give your life to, but this is the one that I would say, man, this is worth giving your life to. And the good news is we win. So I want to encourage you this morning. I'll leave you. Does your heart beat for the nations or for your enemies? Because here's the deal. They may very well have a closed mind and heart to the things of God, and it's, it's going to take one of us to make them open their eyes, Lord willing. So I want to encourage you, as, as Brent and the, the band comes back, I want to encourage you, I want to pray this, and I want to encourage you this morning to think through that. The gospel goes with you, and that carries a lot of weight, a lot of weight. All the distractions of life, all the stuff, as Phil pointed to this morning when he was doing his intro and welcoming, there's a lot going on all around us. But God is good and he's gracious and he's using that for his glory. And I want to encourage you as we go out this morning, I'm going to pray. Um, but the gospel goes with you. So let's make much of him. Uh, God, thank you for your grace and love and for your kindness to us in Jesus. We praise you that you are for us and not against us. And God, you have called us to take, our, to take your name to the nations. God, that is not an easy thing. That is not a light thing. That is a very important, significant, weighty thing. So, God, as we go out, may we make much of you. May we take your name to the nations, to our neighbors, to our enemies, to our families, to our friends. Those that are not, they may very well not know their right from their left. So, God, would you open their hearts to our words through, that you give us, that we would make much of you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd invite you as we close our service to stand once again. We'll sing together in Christ alone.
that is in Christ, we have no guilt in life, no fear of death. You can lift your voice and sing. No care to die, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll find our strength, find our hope, find our help. All right. Good morning, church. Thank you, band. Thank you for leading us so well. Um, and thank you, Chastine, for bringing that, that message. That was just, I think it's just great seeing those, those parallels across Israel, across Nineveh, and across Jonah, and even in my own life. Uh, what a powerful reminder this morning. Um, so I've got a few announcements um, this, today as we close out. Uh, one of them, a heavier announcement that uh, I know the members have kind of already been informed of and just kind of flagging for the rest of you. Um, so this Sunday, uh, Toby re uh, resigned as one of our pastors here and it has um, is going to be, he'll be kind of around and, and about, but if there are questions about that, if there are needs that you have uh, pastorally or anything like that, Chastine and I will be happy to help you with those things, and you can come to, to us and flag that if there are ongoing things that you've been um, doing and, and receiving counsel or whatnot, uh, please please let us know. We'll be happy to help and serve in any way that we can. Um, and with that, just a few announcements. What we did do is we were planning on a new members class next week, and we've actually bumped that back to the 26th, and we'll kind of put that in front of you guys. Uh, that just buys us a little bit more time so that Chastity and I can be prepared to do that together. Um, and then uh, if, you, if you aren't aware of this, all the small groups are down for the summer. And so what we're doing instead are a series of men and women's activities throughout the summer uh, to kind of get some fellowship across all the different small groups so that you can know a few more of the faces that are in the room here with you this morning. And so we're going to have um, some uh, men's breakfast times at Eggs Up Grill over here on Pelham. So if you uh, take the parkway over there, kind of toward the Walmart-ish direction, um, you will find Eggs Up Grill. And we're going to meet there 6.30 to 7.30 a.m., on Thursdays. Uh, it'll be every other Thursday, so that gets a little confusing to keep track of. So on the 2nd, uh, on, on Thursday, uh, June, June 2nd, uh, we'll be over there and just spending some time hanging out, fellowshipping in the Word, um, 
talking over life and, and unpacking that, praying for each other, encouraging each other. Uh, we'll also have some prayer times throughout the summer. Again, also every other week on Wednesday nights, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. here uh, here in, in this space. We'll gather together and, and have some prayer times together. Uh, and then I think the, the women are going to be announcing their schedule for that stuff soon, right, Laurel? Um, and so you'll be getting texted and we'll probably have some kind of handout or something in the back with all of the the ladies stuff because they want it to be nice and clean and polished and professional and us guys don't need that so right um so thank you all for worshiping with us again uh reminder as as chastine uh, reiterated several times there at the end the gospel goes with you <laughs>